What says Halloween more than a haunted house? Whether it's in the form of a horror movie, an amusement park attraction, or even a real home, the concept of terrifying backstories and haunted entities occupying spaces where everyday people live has become synonymous with this holiday and its history. In fact, ever since what is believed to be the 19th century, people have taken time to redecorate their homes and repurpose them with spooky attires, all in the name of a fun thrill. But of course, not all haunted houses are created equal. Something else that has also become a staple in many cities are real haunted houses. Historical homes with a deep backstory, marked together by multiple occasions of ominous sightings from those who once lived there. There are haunted house tours all over the world, but one that surely stands out is the Searle Weed House, located in Savannah, Georgia. From appearances on Forrest Gump, Ghost Adventures, Ghost Hunters, and more, this 19th century behemoth of a home has been the subject of a multitude of the eeriest ghost sightings and creepiest stories you can find. Typically, the discussion of haunted houses is very one-dimensional. To the average skeptic, it will usually boil down to a non-belief in ghosts and paranormal activity, and a subsequent doubt of the eyewitnesses that perpetrate so many of these sightings. And to be totally transparent, of course, we here at Debunk File are very skeptical too, and for nearly every other haunted house story out there, there is admittedly likely a similar approach to what we would take, which is why we don't typically cover these sorts of things. But for this specific haunted house, we were granted a very special opportunity to make it stand out much more than your average coverage of a topic like this. Jif was actually able to visit and go on a tour of the one and only Searle Weed House. And since so much of the discussion regarding paranormal locations are about how they feel when you're there, this time we were actually able to document that, on top of all the other research we did afterwards. Without further ado, this is the Searle Weed House. Tonight we will uncover its tour, its history, and most uniquely, how it felt to actually be there. In 2022, I happened to be on a vacation with my family, which included us staying in Savannah, Georgia for a few days. While we were looking for things to do, we came across a haunted house tour for the old Sorrel Weed House, which could certainly be a unique thing to experience. I've never gotten to take a tour of a haunted house, and I also knew next to nothing about this one, so I figured it would be a really interesting experience, even though I tend to be very skeptical of these sorts of things. As a result, that's exactly what we did. As we arrived, we were greeted by a sign, which gave us a brief backstory of this house in question. This sign essentially tells us about the home in question. It was created by Charles B. Klusky, a well-known Georgia architect, and was a prominent example of the Greek Revival style. It was ultimately completed in 1840, and was made for Francis Sorrell, a shipping merchant of Savannah. Looking up from the sign, we are then greeted by the foreboding yet massive home. Upon entering the mansion, things were set up similarly to the way other sorts of historical walkthroughs are, with a lot of memorabilia placed around, some of which including facts surrounding them. Our tour guide also began giving an overview behind this house and the tour in general. We were told that this tour doesn't play out in a way where it's actively trying to scare you at all, and that things like that are not what they would ever do here, as they will instead allow us to come up with our own conclusions. As far as that overview went, we were naturally told about the various sightings and paranormal happenings that are said to have occurred here. Supposed common happenings include the feeling of being touched, grabbed, or poked, along with of course the general feeling that there's something or somebody watching you. Most notable of all though are the photos. On occasion it has been said that during photos guests would take here, an unexpected visitor would appear in the photo. Again, the tour guide took a very skeptical approach here and mentioned how she sent hundreds and hundreds of photos of supposed entities finding their way in them, but she's able to dismiss nearly every single one of them as being either shadows, smudges, or some other very explainable factor. However, there were a select few images over the years that truly stood out. Unfortunately, I couldn't find this image in its clearest form online, but the main image involved a man taking a photo of himself in front of a mirror. It looks pretty normal as it's just him with somebody else passing by the doorway, except the problem is that there was nobody there. We were told a lot about the architecture of this home, about how it is a whole 16,000 square feet, making it one of the largest houses in the entire city to this day. It was built by the renowned architect Charles Klusky, as was mentioned earlier, in 1837. We were also naturally told about the Sorrell family. Francis Sorrell was one of the wealthiest men in Savannah, mostly because he was a plantation owner, and he would move into the home in 1838. Soon after moving in, Francis would marry Lucinda Moxley, just a few years later though, we would have the first death to take place inside this home, as Lucinda would die at the young age of just 22. Francis Sorrell would very naturally marry Lucinda's younger sister Matilda after this. As we were finished being told that part of the story, we were taken outside to the gorgeous backyard, where ironically the story becomes significantly darker. 
It was here where we were told about the most infamous event that would come to be known about this mansion. At some point during Francis and Matilda's marriage, Francis apparently was caught having an affair with one of the slave women named Molly. This sent Matilda into an absolute spiral, and she reportedly jumped headfirst off the second floor balcony to her death. It didn't end here either though. In this backyard, there was also a carriage house, and shortly after this, Molly was found dead inside of it. These are the most infamous events to have taken place inside of this house, and were likely what soon gave this place its haunted nature. And speaking of that, we were told even more about that as we were taken to the final room of note, that being the basement. According to our guide, and from doing more research online, the basement is said to be the most consistently haunted place in the house. It is also the room that seems like it has undergone the least amount of renovation slash updating out of any room here basically looking as if it's still in the 1800s when you step foot inside of it. As you can see, the lighting was extremely dim and eerie, and we were told about more things that have been reported in here, such as nausea, the feeling of being grabbed, breathing, choking sensations, and also phone and watch batteries getting drained way faster than normal. Unfortunately, I wasn't paying attention to my phone battery while I was in there, but it didn't die on me, that's for sure. You wouldn't be seeing this footage otherwise. As for the rest of the tour, that was really about it. We were given some free time to simply explore the house on our own, take videos, pictures, and whatever until we left. As for the feeling, this is something we will talk more about later, but I will say that for me personally, I didn't exactly feel too much that was out of the ordinary. There is of course a certain feeling that you can get when you're simply standing inside of a historic landmark that has so much history attached to it, but it didn't feel very different to any other historical landmark I've walked through. I didn't feel any of the aforementioned common occurrences that people are said to experience, like getting grabbed, poked, or anything like that. As for the final thing I will say, I do have to bring up the fact that there is more than one type of tour offered at the Sorrel Weed House, and the one that I experienced was the daytime tour. There is a nighttime tour that according to the website features a smaller crowd, has the lights out, and gives you paranormal equipment, and that is something I am much more wary of. Overall though, I don't regret experiencing what my specific tour gave as it seemed much more grounded and less superficial than something like that. We got some history, some backstory, and background behind the house's haunted claims, which is about as much as I could have asked for. While it certainly served as a great jumping off point, there is of course much more to discuss than just what the tour did, so now it is time to do that. Francis Searle was born in Santo Domingo on May 4, 1793, to French Colonel Antoine Francois Sorel and Eugénie de Soutre. Not much is known about her at all, but it is commonly believed that she was actually a free person of color, however she died just a month after Francis was born. He also happened to be born right in the midst of the Haitian Revolution, which meant that not only was his father off and away, but he found himself in constant danger as well, as consistently seeing atrocities. On one occasion, it was even said that he was saved by a group of slaves who refused to take the life of a young boy, something that would prove to be painfully ironic. At the age of 10, his father would leave for good, and Francis would never see him again. Soon after this, he began working as a clerk, and by the time he reached 19 years of age, he was transferred to Baltimore, marking the beginning of his life in America. In Baltimore, he continued being a clerk, and by 1818, he even began working with Henry Douglas, the They first advertised the sale of whiskey, butter, corn, and flour, but they would quickly begin working in the slave trade, with the next few years of this partnership being incredibly successful for them. In 1822, Francis would marry the aforementioned Lucinda Moxley, who was actually the niece of Henry Douglas. Lucinda came from a very wealthy, slaveholding family in Virginia, which would only increase his wealth even more. In 1825, Francis would end his partnership with Henry Douglas. A decision that was said to be on good terms, but regardless, it is still unclear as to exactly why this happened. Regardless, just a year later, he would officially appear as a slave owner for the first time on tax records, making his first lot purchase. Two years later, Lucinda would die of yellow fever, and two years after that, he would marry Matilda Moxley, who as we said, was Lucinda's sister. The next few decades of his life would be categorized by more and more land purchases, continuing to expand his trade no matter what. And by 1839, Charles Klusky had begun building his home at one of them, where the Searle family would live for two decades. But here is where things get interesting. In 1859, the Searle family would actually move out of this mansion, instead moving into a three-story townhouse next door. Meaning that shockingly, 
none of the infamous happenings attributed to the Searle Weed House even happened there. Instead, they all happened next door. In 1860, it was reported that Matilda Moxley had died of a concussion, leaping to her death off the upper level of the home. It was seen as unclear, but without too much questioning as to why or how this happened to the public eye, however, a private, reputable source sheds light on exactly what may have happened. Charles C. Jones Jr. was a close friend and business associate to Francis, and he and his mother actually wrote letters to each other soon after this incident. The initial letter sees Charles simply explaining what happened to his mother, but his mother's reply gives a possible cause. The death of Miss Searle was very distressing. I heard some time since that she was subject to great mental depressions. We are not sufficiently grateful for our preserved reason. Our commonest blessings are greatest. We need only to be deprived of them to feel it so. So this shows from a verifiable source that Matilda was perceived as being in a depressive state close to her death. This is important, but of course next we have to talk about Molly. A lot of sources have questioned the story of Molly, stating that there may have never even been a Molly in Francis's life, and that this story is just an urban legend passed down through time that helps this mansion's haunted case. But is that actually true? Well, what we do know is that in reading slave manifests, there were actually two separate slaves named Molly that were in very possible contact with Francis. There was a 28-year-old woman named Molly who was owned by Francis Searle and was a resident of Savannah, and there was also a 22-year-old woman named Molly who had traveled from Charleston to Savannah and was owned by Charles Green, who was a close friend and neighbor to Francis Searle. It's also been proven through history that sexual relations between slave owners and slaves didn't just happen, they were common. Another aspect that certainly helps this case is when you look into cases around this time of women taking their own lives. Between the years of 1860 and 1870, a whopping 40% of these cases that were reported in papers described these occurrences as resulting from domestic trouble or disappointed love. Now with this being said, Matilda's death was never reported with any indication that it was by her own hands, and it seemed as if it was not very well known in her community that she was suffering from depression either. However, there is a likely reason for why this was the case too. Matilda was an active member on the board of the female asylum. As a result, it is likely that she would have been shunned if knowledge of her depressive state was spread. Furthermore, there is another account that suggests that Francis Searle played some sort of role in her death, and it actually came from his own writing himself. On October 8, 1860, just seven months after Matilda's death, he wrote a letter to his son Alexander, where at one point he states, How my dear and beloved wife would have enjoyed this visit of our friends if her life had been preserved and how much more comfortable she would have made them, than I have been enabled to do. But I must not enlarge on this sorrowful subject. The Lord has bereaved me and laid his chastening rod heavily upon me, and I must submit." This seems to be a straight up admission of guilt, especially with the phrase, the Lord has bereaved me and laid his chastening rod heavily upon me, as that phrase at the time was often used to express justified misfortunes that were placed on to you by God. This of course doesn't prove fully that he was referencing an affair, as there's a possibility that maybe he could have been referencing his ignorance toward her depression, or something else entirely. But with everything we've shown, this affair certainly seems very possible. Regardless, Francis Searle would live until 1870, ultimately dying of a stroke at the age of 77, taking with him a life of contradiction, suffrage, and haunting. It does seem appropriate to get back to that now, doesn't it? The Searle Weed House was first opened to the public in 1940 by the Society for the Preservation of Savannah Landmarks, and was eventually reopened in 2005, where they began doing historic daytime tours and haunted ghost tours during the night. As for actual paranormal activity, unfortunately I couldn't really find just how early sightings were of said to begun, but with how recent these tours started, this certainly isn't a case of a company fully corroborating paranormal activity but that doesn't mean that some of these supposed sightings haven't been helped by these recent tours and the way they are set up either. The most common sightings are said to occur in the basement, and to me this is not a coincidence at all. As Jif documented and observed, the basement is the only room in the entire house that appears to have had minimal updates throughout the years. As you can see, this basement is very dark, only being lit by candles, and this one ominous red light, and well, quite frankly, the entire presentation of this room is just creepy by its very nature. It doesn't shock me at all that people report these occurrences here of all places. When you're already creeped out or on edge, and have heard that this place is paranormal, it is much more likely that you'd begin feeling these things then. 
This is, of course, not to discount everyone's experiences over the years, but it seems relatively clear that the presentation of this room in particular is a large reason as to why so many more paranormal stories are reported here rather than anywhere else. As we have also reported, both of the infamous occurrences that are told regarding the Searle Weed House did not actually happen there, so in regards to paranormal activity, where would that even be coming from? Well, a possible answer for that could actually lie on the plot that the home sits on, rather than the deaths that were falsely attributed to it. The Siege of Savannah was a battle that took place in 1779, and is considered by historians to be the bloodiest hour of the entire American Revolution. As luck would have it, the Searle Weed House is situated right on top of those war grounds, so maybe it is possible that this supposed paranormal activity is just misidentified. Overall, something we will not do here is prove or debunk whether this home really has paranormal activity or not, as that is just a subject that is way larger than us. What we can do and have done is simply context. To tell the story behind this fascinating yet twisted historical landmark, because at the end of the day, the Searle Weed House is now a tourist attraction. Hundreds and thousands of people flock to this mansion in order to get scared and experience ghost tours. And once you learn the home's true backstory, you could probably understand why some people find that concept quite exploitative. It is also a tricky slope too, because in the grand scheme of things, it is also very easy to see how a historical landmark such as this being so easily accessible to all of the public is an undeniable positive too. At the end of the day, in cases like this, please do not forget the most sinister horror of all. That being the suffrage that people like Molly endured, and the suffering that people like Francis Searle partook in. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to like this video and subscribe. If you like the channel, make sure to check out our social medias in the description below. Make sure to stop by our Discord, it really is the best place to chat with us and hang with fellow debunk enthusiasts. Of course, if you'd like to support the channel a little bit more, please head on over to our Patreon, Debunk Plus. With only a dollar a month, you guys get access to videos early, script PDFs, whatever random stuff we decide to put up, and more. This has been another year of Debunktober, and as always, it's been a blast. So, whatever you are up to tonight on All Hallows' Eve, remember to stay safe and have fun. As always, my name is Sep from Debunk File. See you guys next time. Bye.